This video is brought to you by Brilliant. For most of the 21st century, Germany has been the economic envy of Europe. Thanks to its thriving domestic industrial base, Germany is the fourth largest economy in the world, the world's third largest exporter, and it has the highest GDP per capita of any large European country. Foreign politicians are obsessed with Germany, and in 2020 there was even a best-selling book published in the UK titled Why Germans Do It Better – Notes from a Grown-Up Country. However, the outlook for the German economy has markedly deteriorated recently, and in May, Germany announced that it had fallen into recession, with little prospect of a sustained recovery anytime soon. So in this video, we're going to have a look at how the German economy came to be the export-driven powerhouse we know today, what's gone wrong recently, and its prognosis for recovery. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. Now, the first thing to say is that while Germany's economy has definitely outperformed its Western European peers in the 21st century, it wasn't always like this. In fact, the German economy really struggled after reunification in 1990. From 1991 until 1998, Germany grew at an average rate of just 1.3%, down from West Germany's previous rate of nearly 6%. Inflation kicked up from below 2% to roughly 5%, and the German government responded to reduce tax revenues in typically austere fashion by cutting back on public spending. Back then, commentators talked about Germany as the sick man of Europe, in much the same way they talk about the UK today. At the 1998 elections, the governing centre-right coalition, led by the CDU, were pushing for this economic underperformance and replaced by an SDP Green coalition led by Gerhard Schroeder. Unfortunately for Germany, Schroeder didn't fare much better. Just a few years into his premiership in 2002, Germany experienced its version of the dot-com bubble, when high-growth German tech stocks that had been subject to speculation lost 95% of their value in a few weeks, triggering a dramatic credit crunch in the wider economy. And this is basically when it started emerging. In 2003, Schroeder announced his new Agenda 2010, with its landmark policy being the so-called Hartz Reform. The Hartz reforms did lots of things, but perhaps most significantly, they squeezed welfare spending in an attempt to get claimants back to work and reduce the bargaining power of labour and trade unions, which basically allowed German companies to pay lower wages. In his speech, Schroeder warned unions against being, quote, self-righteous in their labour contracts, and the fraction of Germans in trade unions covered by collective bargaining accordingly fell from 80% in the 90s to about 45% today. While the Hartz reforms did indeed reduce the number of Germans on welfare, the jobs created were often insecure and poorly paid. Today, nearly 30% of jobs in Germany are part-time, twice what it was in the 90s, and a report by the German government found that, if you account for taxes and social benefits, the average German household's income was actually lower in 2013 than it was in 1999. Nonetheless, this helped German manufacturing become internationally competitive. And this is when Germany started exporting more stuff than it imports, and became the export powerhouse we know today. Now, obviously, the Hartz reforms aren't the only reason for this. Germany's impressive public education system, its history of heavy industry, and its relative political stability under Merkel all helped. The creation of the euro in 1999 also probably played a part, because it effectively gave the Germans an undervalued currency, as did the accession of Poland and other Central European countries into the EU in the early 2000s, because this gave German manufacturers access to a new pool of cheap but relatively skilled and often German-speaking labour. Whatever the precise cause, from the 2000s until recently, Germany's exports helped it enjoy nearly 20 years of steady economic growth, becoming the biggest economy in Europe. But something has gone wrong in the past couple of years. The German economy was already slowing pre-pandemic, but things have gotten significantly worse in the last 12 months. Germany is now officially in recession. It has some of the highest inflation in the EU, and the IMF expects Germany to be the worst performing economy in the G7 this year. 
To make matters worse, last week the German finance ministry admitted that they didn't think a sustained recovery would happen anytime soon, due to weak global demand. So what's gone wrong for the German economy? Well, as we see it, there are at least three things. The first is that Germany's industry-heavy export-driven growth model no longer looks viable. This is for at least three reasons. First, the competitiveness of German industry relied in part on cheap Russian gas via the Nord Stream pipeline, which is obviously not an option anymore. Second, the world economy is slowing down, which means weak global demand and less demand for German exports. This is especially true in China, which used to be Germany's second largest export market, but has struggled to recover post-pandemic. Third, the wave of industry-focused protectionism sweeping the developed world, especially in America. American protectionism means it's now harder for German companies to sell their stuff to the US, and European industry is struggling to compete with America's super generous subsidies under the Inflation Reduction Act. So you get the idea. Withdrawal of Russian gas, weak global demand, and American protectionism are all undermining Germany's export-led growth model. Second, the German government is paying the price of austerity. In part because they're hyper-cautious about spending, the German government has reliably underinvested in its public services, even when they were running large budget surpluses. German public investment as a percentage of GDP has been far lower than its European peers ever since reunification, and this is hurting its productivity. Germany's road and rail services are nowhere near as good as the international cliches suggest. One in eight of its 40,000 major bridges are no longer in adequate condition, and last year, one in every three German trains arrived late. German trains are actually so unreliable that Switzerland has started cutting back on Deutsche Bahn-operated rail routes running across the Swiss-German border, because they were disrupting the punctual Swiss trains. All this makes it harder to do business in Germany and discourages investment. The third reason is a lack of political stability. As we've explained in previous videos, the German coalition is currently beset by infighting, which means they're not really able to come up with effective policy solutions to Germany's economic malaise. They're especially hamstrung by the debt-phobic FDP, which has reacted to falling poll numbers by playing up to its base and basically vetoing any measures that it feels are too expensive. So that's why the German economy is slowing down. Ultimately, whether it recovers depends both on global and domestic politics, whether this wave of protectionism continues, and whether the government uses its enormous fiscal space to good effect. TLDR is all about independent journalism and using facts and data to back up our reporting. We truly believe in the importance of this, and hopefully you do too. As such, we're brushing up on our data and analysis skills to make ourselves better reporters, and we're doing that on Brilliant. They're the STEM learning platform full of all kinds of courses, which can help with improving your career and understanding of the world. For instance, their hypothesis testing course allows us to better analyse claims and test our own assumptions and theories. Or the predicting with probability course helped us better understand projections and forecasts, allowing us to better understand when there's something weird going on with official projects. It's not just statistics though, the interactive and engaging courses over at Brilliant can take you through all kinds of important topics, from the worlds of maths, data science, and computer science. Brilliant have been a long-term supporter of the channel, so if you've ever considered checking it out, we'd really appreciate it if you used our link. That way, they'll continue to support us, and perhaps more importantly for you, the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Thanks for watching, and thanks to Brilliant for supporting TLDR.